Good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that the place in which we work and study is situated within the traditional unceded lands of the Genegahaga or Mohawk peoples, part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. There's also a strong historic presence of Anishinaabe peoples in what is now known as the Greater Montreal area. Chichoge, or Montreal, has also long been and continues to be a gathering place for many First Peoples from all directions. We honor and thank the traditional custodians of this land and strive to work for the success of future generations. On behalf of the Vanier College English Department, I would like to welcome you to Who's Freedom? Art, Text, and Expression in the Public Domain, our 10th Annual Symposium. My name is Matt Goldberg. I am the, uh, the chairperson of this year's Symposium Committee, and I'll also be hosting this event today. Um, and uh, I'll be here throughout this three-day series uh, in which we are presenting a wide variety of speakers, performers, activists, and writers exploring the impact of language and voice. We're going to be asking a ton of tough questions during this symposium, questions like whose voice deserves to be listened to and to be amplified? Uh, what are the consequences of pushing aside those stories we don't want to hear? And how can language be a tool both to empower and to imprison? This event would not be possible without the support of numerous collaborators. And so I'd like to take a moment to thank the Faculty of General Education, the Faculty of Arts, Business and Social Science, Vanier's Director General and Academic Dean, Vanier's Communication Office, the Vanier College English Department, SCI, Vanier's Indigenous Studies Program, Student Services, VTV for helping disseminate these talks afterwards, and our many speakers and performers. And you, of course, are a wonderful audience. Before I introduce our next and final speaker for the day, I'd like to ask you to please refrain from recording this session, both out of respect for our guest, as well as uh, because I already am recording this session. When possible, we are gonna provide recordings of our symposium talks to the uh, larger venue community through VTV. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, there will be time for a Q&A after the talk. So if you'd like to learn more from our guests, please send those questions in and uh, yeah, we will attempt to answer them. All right. Our final speaker for today is Omari Newton. Um, Omari Newton is uh, an award-winning professional artist and a senior instructor at the Vancouver Film School. As a writer, his original hip-hop theater piece, Sal Capone, received critical acclaim in multiple productions, including a recent presentation at Canada's National Arts Centre. Omari uh, also works as an actor, uh, director, creator, has done all kinds of incredible work. And uh, I'm thrilled he's able to join us here from Vancouver. Uh, one of the small advantages, I guess, of, of having this symposium online. Today, Omari is gonna be talking about art as a tool for social change, both to empower the individual and to make shifts and changes within our society. So here to talk about the transformative power of art, please welcome Omari Newton. Thank you so much for the intro, uh, Matt Goldberg. Uh, full disclosure, Matt Goldberg and I have been friends for over 20 years. We went to the same high school and actually started doing theater together. So our, the origins of my life as an artist are actually like connected to knowing Matt since Beaconsfield High School is where I got my start. So shout out to Matt uh, Goldberg. Um, yeah, my name is Amari Newton. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I am Zooming in. Yeah, shout out to BHS, saw Marianne Lynch, yeah. So I'm zooming in um, from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, otherwise known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And you know, one of my uh, indigenous friends pointed this out to me, and I think it's something that's important to, to reflect. We say these things, we do our land acknowledgements, we say, you know, the unceded territory, but words are important and we get disconnected from the words. Uh, my, my friend told me that unceded means this land that we are on was not lost in a war. It was not uh, signed over in a treaty. It was unceded in the sense that we are quite literally occupying this, this land and took it over. Uh, so I think we should show, show, show a moment of gratitude and empathy for the fact that they haven't kicked our asses off this land because they'd be justified to do so. Thought that'd be important to say. So uh, today we're talking about uh, art as a tool for social change and the transformative power of art. And I guess I'll, I'll sort of talk about my origins of how I got into art and got into being a creative person. Um, the first rhyme I ever wrote, because uh, in addition to being an actor and director, I'm also a slam, a slam poet. But the first rhyme I ever wrote was a protest song. I was in the second grade and I wrote a rhyme about uh, recycling. Uh, and I remember as a kid, you know, at the time in the, in the 80s, 
acid rain was the big thing. And I remember hearing about this acid rain thing and how the rain was going to kill our environment so bad for us. And even as a kid, I was really frustrated by hearing about this thing that was, you know, damaging to all of us and nobody seemed to be doing anything about it. And I remember, you know, in my kid brain using kid words, talking to my mom about how frustrating this was and like why nobody would do anything. And to my mom's credit, my mom was one who was like, well, why don't you write something down about it? You know, you like poetry, you like rhymes. Uh, why don't you, oh, hang on. Someone said, please send, hang on. Oh, so, oh same question to the Q&A, there we go. So my, my, my mom uh, was the one who suggested to me because she knew that I loved reading and I loved like Dr. Seuss and rhyming books and got into to hip hop at a young age because my, my parents, she suggested that I put these thoughts and these frustrations into rhyme. So for me, art, uh, activism and social change have always been inextricably linked. Uh, partly because of my parents, and I think partly because of the fact that uh, you may have noticed while watching this that I am, in fact, a Black man. Uh, I've been a Black man for at least uh, 42 years of my life. No, my whole life I've been a Black man. Uh, but I find as a person of color or a BIPOC person, everything is political in a sense, right? When you're navigating a world where uh, white supremacy is a thing and systemic racism is a thing, everything is political, just your, your very existence is political. So to me, it always made sense that my art would be political as well. What leaned into this uh, heavily, in addition to my parents encouraging me to write this uh, you know, environmentalist rap when I was a young person, my parents always made a point to expose me at an age when I was probably too young to really fully understand and probably legally watch this stuff, given the, the ratings, to watch amazing works of art by people like Spike Lee. I remember watching Do the Right Thing when I was a really young kid uh, and just being blown away by not just the, the artistry and, and the colors and the beauty of, of the film itself that was being made, but the political and social commentary that was being made in this thing that was so entertaining and engaging at the same time as being educational. And uh, Spike Lee films were actually my gateway drug into hip hop music because those of you old enough to remember, and if you, by the way, if you haven't seen Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, I highly recommend you watch it. It still uh, hits hard today and is still relevant to this day. Uh, but Public Enemy wrote a song called Fight the Power that was the, the soundtrack to this amazing movie, uh, Do the Right Thing. I remember learning more about Chuck D and Flava Flav and how they, they you know, as, as I got older, I appreciated the fact that they, they really did try to craft their entire aesthetic like they were superheroes. And the supervillain that they were fighting against was racism and white supremacy, and they were very overt about this. So I think this had a, a profound uh, impact on me as a young artist and helped lead me towards the work that I do today as a playwright and a slam poet. Now, I can and will talk to you about my artistic work more today. But I think to give you guys some context about the type of work I do, sharing some poems with you would be more impactful than be talking about it. So if I may, I'm gonna share with you guys a piece called The Brightest Star in Babylon. It's the first piece. And this was inspired by athlete and activist Colin Kaepernick and the stance he took against uh, the NFL. And at the time that stance really was not popular. And way back in, I think it was like 2016, as part of an annual Black History Month tour that, I, that I've been doing for a decade in schools across uh, Canada, I shared this slam poetry piece with youth as a way of introducing them to this idea of, of people using your platform for resistance. And I find poetry and art is a great way to express important themes without boring people. So let me share this first piece with you called The Brightest Star in Babylon. It goes like this. The brightest star in Babylon shone high above them all. He was lauded and applauded for his prowess with the ball. See, he could grip the stitches and toss pigskins across pitches and run a 4 440 for fame, fortune, and riches. See, what was amazing was in his early days, his life was so pathetic, but through athletics, he could get it all and live a life prophetic. He ruled his high school from youth to elementary. The overseer saw that this boy could be exemplary. The system could have missed him. They would feed till the boy was fixed on a path of selling more kicks than Bruce Lee flicks. Academia soon came knocking, offering solutions to poverty. The boy had won the lottery. He'd be molded like pottery, spun until he was tottery, as ships crossing the watery. Transatlantic scholarships came in frantic, hyperbole most gigantic. They said, you 
are the greatest, kid. A King James revival. Bible verses should be, could be rehearsed to sing your praise. You have no rival. If you aren't a shining star, the world should sue us all for libel. You could be the king of USC or Notre Dame upon campus arrival. Survival of the fittest through archival evidence leaves some skittish, but you've got the special something that will silence all the critics. And with an iron fist to marvel at and speed to go for days, you can march on like Lynch or Raider holding down the bay in this war of star invaders with dark forces kid don't play. They will witness your fitness and they will scream out, boo my yay. They said your shine can redefine the limits placed on your kind. The only cost, your soul, just sign on this dotted line. You must be squeaky clean and pledge allegiance to the flag that was used to wipe your ancestors clean like black oil on mechanics rags. See? Michael Jordan laid the blueprint. If you want to put a true dent in this rare era of athletic fame, you just need to do this. Swallow pride and opinion and just hawk them J's, cash them checks, son, get paid. Never mind all the things you left behind on the outside. Brush that injustice like dust off your shoulder with other things you left behind. The streets are a thing you've got to push out of your mind. Wash those thoughts down with Gatorade. Just do it, son, you'll be fine. And by the age of nine, they had his mind. The boy was sold the whole complex. Run the ball, rule them all, knock them down, cash the checks. And when he grew into a man, the plan was set into motion without commotion. The notion that anyone would have declined to show devotion to the corporate overlords would have floored the boards at Nike and Adidas. But as the boy was set to fall in line, a message pierced his mind. Rosa Parks, her spirit near him, tells him, sit down and define how the prophet Muhammad Ali shunned while in his prime was less important than the legacy the man could leave behind. Think of Tommy Smith raising black love fists in 1968 with John Carlos and Peter Norman speaking truth against the state. You could live a wealthy man, but you must understand a boy who stands for nothing falls for anything master plans. So from deep within the beast, Without a speech, preach, or chatter, the boy knelt quietly on the sidelines and whispered, Black Lives Matter. Thank you. So that's the first piece I wanted to share with you guys today. And I want to, uh, to talk to you guys a little bit about this piece. Now, if I try to speak to young people or speak to anybody really, and I say to them, Hey guys, um, I am going to talk to you about uh, systemic racism throughout history. Uh, I'm going to include literary references in this talk about systemic uh, racism. I'm going to talk about uh, athletes as activists and tools for social change, and it will be done in an auditorium in the context of education everyone would roll their eyes out of their head and nobody would want to hear anything about it, right? But the amazing transformative power of art, and for me, specifically like urban arts, things like hip hop and spoken word, thank you. I see people writing uh, nice comments, thank you very much. And I, I'll stop for a second. People are saying amazing rap, and I'm glad you caught that because to me, as somebody who grew up influenced by hip hop culture, so my earliest years, like I told you, were public enemy, spoken word and slam poetry to me is just acapella hip hop. Because hip hop and and hip hop and, and lyrics in and of themselves have their own rhythm and their own cadence, and I'm glad that you can hear that in the poetry uh, that I spit. So, yeah, the the themes and the imagery and the stuff that I address in that poem would not be uh, palatable to most people if you just did it as a lecture or you sat down, you made people read a book, and I think that is the amazing transformative power of art, and no matter what your artistic medium is, you have this ability to use it as a tool to unpack and address complex issues in a way that people find interesting uh, and engaging. Now, sometimes this is done more abstract. Like if you watch Contemporary Dancers, I mean, one of the, one of the most powerful shows I ever saw in my life was a show called uh, Betrovenheit. And this was a dance show. And the, the backstory behind this dance show was wild. And I, I happen to know the backstory, but even if I didn't, so this is a real thing that happened. There was a, a couple who took their family camping and uh, they went to sleep uh, in a cabin and their children went to sleep in another cabin. And somehow while the parents were sleeping in one cabin and the children were sleeping in the other cabin, the cabin the children was in caught on fire. And the parents, and I'm sorry, this is, I'll give you guys a trigger warning, this is graphic, but the parents woke up in time to see this cabin burning down. And the, the father 
uh, tried to open the door as, as it was on fire, got third degree burns on his hand. And, uh, you know, witnesses say that when they, when they showed up on the scene and they saw him, he was still standing there kind of frozen in this moment of trying to reach his children in this burning cabin. Now, the reason why I give you this context is that dance piece, Betroven Height, was, was um, choreographed by this amazing artist named Crystal Pipe. Uh, and the, the main actor in it, who's also a dancer, was this guy named Jonathan Young. And he was the father or the parents who watched his children die in this horrific way. And, you know, you could only imagine the levels of pain and suffering and grief that anybody watching when their loved ones die in this way uh, would have. But he'd spoken in interviews about after some time had passed, he used this dance piece, this abstract dance piece that was allowed, enabled him to explore this really dark and difficult theme and the grief he was feeling to express it in a way that if you didn't know the backstory, you might not know exactly what it's about, but you knew it was a story about loss. And you knew it was a story about a parent's love and about family. And, and to this day, it, it was one of the most affecting pieces I saw. And I'm not a dancer. I don't, you know, I'm not uh, fluent in dance, but it affected me on a visceral level. I mean, of course, if there's fans of music here, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys have songs that you just hear the first chord of it and it makes you cry. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I feel like I have one of the easier mediums in terms of uh, expressing things as a writer and a poet. I can use words to, to express uh, complex thoughts and complex feelings I have and mix them together uh, to share poetry with you guys. But this, this has always been my go-to when I'm feeling stressed out. And it, it really actually, art and poetry really helped me get through the pandemic. And actually the last piece I'll share with you guys today deals explicitly with, uh, uh, it's called The Essential Service of Art, and I actually did it as a TED Talk. You can find it on the TEDx Whistler website, but I can share it with you live here today. But that deals explicitly with how I felt during the pandemic and how I was able to cope with it through art. So, yeah, in essence, I find if people want to understand me and, and know who I am as a man and as a Black man, best, the best way to do it is through the works of art I create. I'm much more open and vulnerable, vulnerable and expressive in my art than I am as a, a person just one-on-one. -on -one. And on that note, I'll share uh, my second poem with you guys. So this poem is, is a different tone. It's kind of a, a funnier one. It's a signature piece because I wrote it 10 years ago and I've been performing it across Canada for a while. But this, again, unpacks themes of, of racism and this is about the first time I was called the N-word. And the first time really I was confronted with uh, racism as a young child. And it's a piece called uh, Doo Doo Brown. And it goes like this. When I was a young lad playing the sandbox, a boy screamed, N-word, your skin is doo doo brown. So I got mad pissed and caught my fist to deliver a crushing pound. When suddenly from above me, I heard this frightening sound. It was my mother on the balcony saying, boy, put your fist down. Sheepishly, I agreed and balled my fist and lowered my head. Then my mom said, boy, come home right now and make your backside red. Embarrassed and scared, I said a prayer and I hoped no one was looking. I bit my lip, let a final threat slip and headed for my whooping. My dad said, boy, you can't punch white people right out in the open. When the police come, you'll be the one they cuff. That ain't no joke. And explain to mom and dad what that boy said to make you vex. And when you explain things to West Indian parents, a beating is always next. I said, mommy, he called me the N-word, said my skin was doo-doo brown, acting like this was no place for me and I should leave this town. My mother touched my little head. My father said, son, listen, you can't use violence every time someone is dissing. Then my folks, they spoke in unison. And this is what they said. They said, your skin is brown, like Ella's sound like Jordan's round ball head, like mango trees and fallen leaves and freshly baked sweetbread, like foundation beams and the earth that breathes and dried coconuts in the West, brown is the color of Muhammad Ali's chest and Maya Angelou's text. That boy is just confused. You have to set him right. Then my parents held me in their arms so I fell asleep that night. So the very next day, I went out to play and there was that same boy smiling. He figured I caught a beating and was ready to keep on wilding. So this same racist young man, destined for the clan, screamed, N-word, your skin is doo-doo brown. 
And I just looked at him and shook my head. Then smacked that smile into a frown. Now, my mom and dad were right that night, but you must remember this. My palms are white, but when I fight, brown is the color of my fist. And that's my second poem. Thank you guys for listening. So what's, what's fun about that one, <laughs> what's fun about that poem is that, um, you know, it uses theatrical techniques in that I'm impersonating uh, characters because I'm also, you know, I've been a, a stage actor and I've also been a TV actor uh, from, for many, many years. So that piece em employs some acting techniques in addition to uh, the poetry and whatnot. And, you know, it allows me to unpack and deal with this like really traumatic, awful memory, right? Of being called the N-word for the first time. That wasn't fun but I can do it in a way that's safe and even brings out some elements of humor. And again, imagine if I told you guys, yo, I'm gonna tell you guys a story about uh, being uh, racially abused and then smacking a child, right? People would be like, whoa, you can't, can't talk about that stuff. But art I find uh, allows me, and gives me the license to explore these things in, in a way that is safe. So I, I just think it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool for uh, social change. Now I do, I do have one more piece I'd like to share with you guys before I, uh, I open it up, just to answer any questions that you guys might have about uh, activism or poetry or, or anything. Uh, does anyone, but in the, anyone have any questions about that poem specifically before I share the last poem? I guess Matt can tell me if anyone's asking any. No? Okay. Well, if nothing just are... yet, but I wanted to, I mean, maybe yeah. for taking a pause, do you want yeah. to talk a bit about uh, about using your life and uh, mm. truth in art. Uh, how much yeah. do you rely on what is true versus what feels true? Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, question. It's funny, uh, Jason Katz and teacher of Anya, he's, he's on right now. We've also been friends for about the same amount of time for like 20 years. Growing up, we had a really funny uh, saying. I don't know if you remember this, Jason. It was, uh, was it for purposes of story? <laughs> 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 was it FPS? <laughs> Uh, and I think one of the fun things about being uh, FPS, that's right, Jason. So we would joke about this for years that like, you know, I, I'm West Indian, Jason, you know, is of Jewish heritage and we like, we're storytellers, right? Our people will tell stories and, and embellishing when you're telling a story can improve the story. It's like the dressing. Yeah, West Indians represent, that's right. So, you know, I just, for whatever reason, grew up around a funny group of, of friends, and it was kind of assumed that we, we didn't, we would never lie, right? You don't make things up, but you, you can elaborate on the details of your story for comedic effect or for dramatic effect, and you can, you can do it in your regular life. But what's amazing as an artist is you have full-on license to elaborate things. But just to let you know, that story is true. I did have a kid call me the N-word when I was when I was young, and I did smack the kid despite my parents telling me uh, that I should just like turn the other cheek and be peaceful. So they're, they're the, the core of the story of all my stories is always based in truth and some kind of real emotion, but I, I allow myself uh, for purposes of story, the license to elaborate for comedy or whatnot. That was a good question. We do have another question that came in about this poem and, uh, and your discussion of it. Do you think of art then as a defense mechanism, as a way of coping with these difficult personal emotions? I like to think of it as going on the offensive, actually, because a, a defense mechanism, because, you, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with being Black, right? And I'm, I'm lucky. I, I had parents who raised me to have a great sense of pride. A defense mechanism would be like, I got something to prove, but I, I operate from the stance of what's wrong with you? Like, what's your beef with, with people of color or Muslim people or gay people? Like, I just think it's lame to discriminate against people. So I think it, it is a great way to either disarm people uh, with comedy or to frame a conversation in a way that you think is more intellectually or emotionally honest than, might, than it might be portrayed in, in mainstream narratives. So yeah, I see it as a way to go on the offensive. Thank you, Omari. I will disappear back into the background now. Oh, it was so nice seeing you. I, you know, so, so can, I, can I for a second tell you guys how weird doing this kind of thing is? I can't see any of you. It's like normally when you're doing a, a, a presentation or a speech, you can see the audience, you're like riffing off people, you hear if, if your poems are like landing or popping and, and I, it's like I do a poem and then I'm just like, 
<laughs> like hoping that people are feeling it, but you have no idea. So I, your your face on camera was was very welcome back. Um, if it if it helps, uh, my mic keeps yeah, I keep getting the warning that my laughter. Uh, you're muted right now. Do you do you want to take control again? No, 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 no. Anyway, <laughs> you're great, Amari. Thank you. No, that's totally fine. I can't remember what was I, what was I talking about now. You were about to transition to your third piece. I was going to transition to my third piece. That's right. Okay, so. Uh, I mentioned to you guys that at the height of the pandemic, art really saved me and my, my being creative saved me. And I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate. Like among the darkest times I've ever experienced in my life was like in the midst of the pandemic when it was already tough, right? Being so afraid about getting sick, so afraid. I mean, I'm in Vancouver right now, as you guys know, and my, my family, I'm from Montreal. I grew up there. Most of my family and my close friends are, are still in Montreal. And I know that you guys were at like the epicenter of, of lockdowns and COVID breakout. And it was just, I, I was just, I, I felt like I couldn't breathe easy until I got like my first vaccine for sure. And then double vax for sure. It was tough. And then in the middle of this pandemic, as many of you remember, uh, the video of George Floyd went viral. So I was already feeling isolated and depressed and really struggling. And then I see a video of a guy who looks kind of like me getting murdered, straight up murdered on camera, callously, slowly by a police officer. So I went to a really, really dark place. And I'm sure like many of you guys, while I was at home in self-isolation lockdown, I really withdrew into like Netflix and live concert videos. I, I used to, I mean, I love going to concerts. I love music. And that was one of the things, I mean, and as a professional performer, of course, relying on gathering together and communing together and sharing an experience, that's literally what I do for a living. And before I did that for a living, I was a fan of that. I was a fan of going to concerts. I was a fan of going to theater and being faced for the first time ever with the prospect of not being able to gather together to watch art, not being able to watch theater, not being able to go to concerts really affected me. So I would, I would watch, you know, videos of like, whether it was Oceaga in uh, Montreal or Coachella and just watch these performances. And I would binge through Netflix, just like binging through series, just to lose myself um, in these worlds as a form of escapism. And it really made me reflect on the status that art and artists often have in mainstream society. And if there's any artists listening right now, hopefully you can relate to, to what I'm saying here. But I remember when I was in school, the general sentiment was, if you weren't good at math or science and you weren't going into math or science, you're gonna be a bum, you're gonna be a loser, you're adding no value to society, like why even bother? And as somebody who was always like creatively inclined, my, my favorite subjects were always like English and sociology and drama. I just got a message really early on in my life that those weren't valuable, that those were like second class fields of study. And it used to really upset me and really um, piss me off. And then, you know, counterbalancing that with being at home during this global pandemic and being one of billions or whatever, with just millions of people sitting at home and relying on art to get through stuff, it occurred to me that art truly is an essential service. And I don't mean this in this like corny kind of Tony Robbins way, but I mean, quite literally, just imagine for a second what you would have done without the existence of art during the pandemic when you were forced to stay inside all day. And now keep in mind, this would include uh, video games. This would include music, TV, film. You can't draw anything. Imagine what we as a society or we as people would have done if we did not have artistic works to retreat to. And it just, it really fired me up and made me upset as a professional artist thinking like, well, why do we get such disrespect as an art form? And why does it start so young? If clearly during times of crisis, people retreat towards the arts as a, a coping mechanism. And around the times I was having these thoughts, uh, I was approached uh, by the people at uh, TED Talks, uh, specifically it was TEDx Whistler. And they, they, they knew about some of the work I did in schools. And I'm also very proud to say that I'm, a, I'm an educator, I'm a teacher, uh, I'm a senior instructor at the Vancouver Film School. So they knew that I was an artist, they knew I was an educator, and they approached me through the Vancouver Film School and they asked if I wanted to do a TED Talk. So when I was asked what I would do a TED Talk about, 
I was reflecting on this thing of art as a tool for social change and the essential service. And this is what I decided to do something about. And I thought to myself, you know, this thing is going to exist on the internet <laughs> forever. So what would I really want to say, right? If these are the last things people read that come out of my mouth, what is it that I'd want to say? And I will share that with you now. This is the last piece I'm going to share with you guys before we open it up to broader conversation. But this is called The Essential Service of Art. And it goes like this. The Essential Service of Art. The Essential Service of Art truly starts to take focus when potential nervously darts hearts to straight choke us. Dark moments of the soul close in, leaving us smothered. Perspective rejected, disconnected from one another. As a child, I was profiled and labeled as deficient. It was wild, I couldn't sit still, seen as insufficient. Teachers tried to put me on pills to keep me still, reacting to my hyperactive nature until I was literally insidiously robbed of a voice. Polyps grew on my vocal cords and left me with little choice to project my thoughts with clarity due to this genetic rarity. All my thoughts within me, I struggled to get by without my teacher's charity. All the thoughts within me strained to just come out. My raspy voice earned me the nickname of horse mouth. It happened soon I was doomed to be lost in a system that hates to educate those who fate made learn different. Teacher called my parents to meeting asked them to listen as they tried to sell them on the bad news and I was different. My mother, like any other West Indian woman wouldn't have it. She said, my son can reach for any star in the sky. Don't even try it. Claims of lacking focus are bogus. The boy is just creative. When you move his soul, his mind is fully concentrated. Parents took me from that office with the softest approach, told me to ignore the poor reports of any sort that they wrote. Then they took me home to hone the task of my re-education, deprogramming the slamming meant to leave my confidence shaking. They brought me to a room where these lessons would start and introduced me to a treasure trove of transformative art. My dad said, bye. Let me introduce you to Run DMC, LL Cool J, and Public Enemy. Can you hear it? The lyrics of a man named Chuck D. One left on VHS, can't test the man Spike Lee. You should do the right thing, son, and watch this flick. Absorb the lessons you're getting and lift your spirits up quick. Like Nestle, you best be quick liquid like a jet ski, skipping towards the goal of greatness like a black Gretzky. Number 99 is fine, but son, you were meant to explore your passion and cash at a rate of 100%. I was empowered to devour anything that fed my soul, and I continued this tradition till I was old and grown, till I hit a wall and stalled, the bottom finally thrown. Instead of freedom through expression, I found my spirit owned. The essential service of art truly starts to take focus. When sequential elements and striped life straight choke us, dark moments of the soul close in, leaving us smothered. Perspective rejected, disconnected from one another. In a pre-pandemic paradise, I passively practiced my passion with patience, performing perfected text that disconnected eyes vacant. When opportunity knocked, I opened every door to take it, authentically invested and heavily selling out. But it's hard to tell what to sell when all you have are doubts. As a professional actor, I now factored in the voices inside and went out without. True story. I once ungloriously deposited a check that I earned from grinding out a few lines upon a movie set. This check deserved respect because it contained more zeros than two, though less than four it was way more than I earned before this shoot. I strolled up to my bank with a mean mug like I was rich, popped in my card, punched in my code, and gave my chin an itch. I finally made some dough. My bank would know that I'm the man. My profession, a confession, my profession finally made a couple grand. I placed the check in the machine with a mean mug that was clean as a dapper famous rapper on the cover of the Source magazine. It was all a dream. I used to eat cold little cans of beans, salt and pepper, my only condiments. I'm living lean. And now I'm thinking of a master plan with dozens of hundreds of paper dollars in my hand. Slid that envelope in for the win, then bam, my thousand air dreams came crushing with a slam. My bank ranked me with a value low as a rusted dustbin. They froze my cash almost as fast as I had put it in. The reality of corporate interest had derailed my festivities. My first large deposit for art flagged unusual activity. Now, Let's reflect on this a stitch. My bank found it weird that a professional artist started to be paid for the first time in years. It appears the system's mission is still to make sure artists are down even when we're up. This mindset is a threat we'll regret if we don't disrupt. The essential service of art truly starts to take focus. When, when sequential elements and strife life straight choke us, dark moments of the soul close in, leaving us smothered, perspective rejected, disconnected from one another. As a starving artist, I'm trying to harness all this energy inside and without. 
but life is difficult when I'm trying to make it through without a doubt. Let me enlighten the frightened many who never had folks like mine and employ you to explore the limits of your creative mind. Maybe you're a nurse heading home from the ICU, feeling drenched in the stench of mounting death surrounding you. And the way to save your day is hitting the bay and sitting at the dock with brother Otis, whose flows just so to free you from your thoughts. Or maybe you serve on the front lines for less than minimum wage, and you can't afford to miss a shift and zoom out from this plague. Or tragically, your hip went out at 38 years old. You look ahead by a century at what the future holds. It's been a long time running, fireworks began to fade, kids gotta eat, stay on your feet till little bones just break. Or you're already starving as a small business proprietor just to have your store window smashed open by rioters in protest of a problem that's already cost you life's work. But this vinyl stash of Johnny Cash can elicit at least a smirk. Embrace your inner Jean-Michel. Let your heart burst and swell like Basquiat's freshest thoughts splashed on the canvas so well. Me? I want to write rhymes despite times of dismay so I can light eyes when sight lines are so vague. When those who fight crimes at night times disobey the laws that cause a pause of our trust in those in power. I seek refuge in the priceless art that righteously devours. For in these dark times, when we ploy to avoid a chat with Osiris, sheltering in place as we face this faceless virus, I reflect on times I've been beat down before I found my voice, how my folks found my soul and helped me rise above this smoke in the waters of the sons and daughters who were taught to dream and explore the depths of this condition that can make us weep or scream. The need to feel our soul as a goal in sharp focus. So play that song, write that book, create your magnum opus, or wrap yourself in someone else's if you're feeling hopeless. Just remember where you turned as the world locked itself down. It was art that kept the hope afloat when souls were set to drown the essential service of art. And that's my last poem that I uh, did as a TED talk. And you can find that on the TEDx YouTube page. There you go. Thanks, Matt. Thank Please. you, Amari. I didn't know if I should come on to applaud for the previous, but you- I mean, I'll, I'll take it anytime. <laughs> I see the cute face is nice. Right on. Um, we have had a, a bunch of questions come in for you. So, uh, but feel free, if you have questions you'd like to ask Omari, please send them through the Q&A function uh, just there at the bottom of your screens. Um, I have a lot, but I feel I need to address some of the questions in the, uh, that are coming from the audience. We have a number of questions about your creative process. People mm -hmm. who wanna know, first off, how you manage to be creative in this, difficult time, but then also about what your process is like, how you move from that initial inspiration through writing, editing, and ultimately performance. What do you do? Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that, like, my favorite thing to do is write rhymes. I'm a retired MC. Uh, I used to be in a band called Kobayashi back in the day. Uh, and actually, one of my bandmates, Radu Falcon, is a teacher of Vanya also. He used to play bass in the band. So I, you know, I love writing rhymes. So this is what I do when I'm when I'm feeling uh, stressed out, right? I so that's it's not work. I feel like it's what it's like my some people like to play video games. I like to write rhymes and and spoken word is a, a great medium for me because it combines all the things I've trained my life for, which is you know, live performance, writing and performing the things I write. So did that answer the question? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that's such a gift, right? We all aspire to have that uh, that willingness to just jump in. And I think there's so many distractions. Do you find though that you have to do anything to put yourself in that creative mindset or it, is it really that easy? It normally helps when I'm really mad about something or really upset about something, yeah. you know what I mean? Like most of my poems are either like a protest song or it's an argument that I'm trying to make and a point I'm trying to land. And of course, you know, I went, I went through phases where, or I've gone through phases where I can't write at all. Like at the height of the pandemic, I didn't write, write, want to write anything. It was so dark that, but I think most creative people will tell you the creative process is not just about churning stuff out like you're a machine, right? Like soaking in the news and, and reading works of art. That's part of the process is filling yourself up with this fuel to like, you know, mold and repurpose back out into the world. And how much time, I mean, I'm sure there's not a single answer to this, but moving from the initial inspiration uh, through to the editing, are you, are you the kind of performer that needs to get it down and then speak it to find, or do you have a lot of an editing process? So it's interesting. This, for this, other people might find this interesting too. So you know how when you watch TED Talks, you're like, why is that like doctor or that dentist such a good public speaker, right? It's really, it's really weird. 
I learned through this process that TED, the TED Talks have it down to a science now. So for this piece that I did here, I had the initial draft and then every week leading up to the date of your performance. And because of the because of um, COVID, mine was recorded, but usually they're live. But every week leading up to for like a month or for two, for, sorry, for two months, they would have, we'd have Zoom meetings where a panel of awesome people who were, they were artists and, and musicians and stuff. I would share the poem with them and they would make suggestions and we, we collectively would edit it so it would fit the TED format and be appropriate to, to the talk. So this process was a very curated one. I mean, playwriting, playwriting is just rewriting. <laughs> playwriting is like, I cannot tell you, it takes me five years to write a play, which is a whole other conversation. Um, but generally speaking, poetry, I try to do in creative bursts. So I'll just sit down and write a full poem. Like the one about Kaepernick, I think I did in one sitting. Wow, that, that is amazing. I mean, that, that piece is so so sharp. I would have had no idea. No, oh, thanks, man. Um, we have a question, it's a tricky question. I'm curious mm -hmm. how you're gonna tackle it, about the role of aesthetics in activist art. Uh, namely, how important is it for the art to actually be good? I think there's some anxiety that, if we can use these terms, that in this more politically correct time that the bar has been lowered somehow. I, I wonder how you would respond to that idea and maybe talk about this idea of, of the importance of the message as it relates to the aesthetics of the art, the quality of the art. I mean, I think it's it's vital, right? And I think it's interesting though, because good is totally subjective especially when it comes to things like music or comedy or like there's there's stuff that I think is trash, but it connects with people on a visceral level. But I think so long as the intended audience or, or whatever audience is consuming it, if it if it has meaning to them and it moves them, then it's good in their, you know, in, in their mind, it's good. But like if I wrote a poem that was just me kind of pedantically preaching about my my politics in a monotone way and people checked out I don't think it would be an effective it wouldn't be effective as a piece of art or activism because it wouldn't move anyone to listen or change so I think aesthetics are very important which is which is you know I'm 42 years old and like I told you guys I wrote my first law my first rhyme when I was eight years old so this process for me as an artist is literally like a lifelong journey of consuming art you know listening to hip-hop writing hip-hop rewriting hip-hop so i i just i'd i'd like to think knock on wood i'm at a point now where i'm okay at it <laughs> so for me for me i like to think the stuff i put out is good some better than others but you know what about the other work that you consume from other artists you, you mentioned that one dance piece but um what do you seek out as an artist other other works that you consume i seek out passion I uh originality you know like this is like my my artistic taste like from music are so eclectic like I I think like Imogen Heap is one of my favorite musicians I, I I find she she's always moved me to tears just hearing the way that she uses her voice and loops you know I think Radiohead is one of my favorite bands they're they're incredible I think uh Tori Amos is amazing you know I, I listen to these people and and they they really move me just the, the way that they're it's so clear that their voice is connected to their emotion and they're they're conveying things in an honest way versus you know look everybody enjoys a good pop song every now and then but you know the average pop song you listen to on the radio and you can tell it's made in a factory somewhere and there, there's no the the, the uh, it's it's cultural product the objective of most pop songs is to get spins on the radio and make money and there's a big difference right you can tell when Radiohead does an album like, you know, OK Computer, they weren't like, we're going to sell a billion records doing 15 minute songs about isolation, <laughs> you know? So, and then, you know, as as an MC, like Kendrick Lamar stuff, I find really incredible. Uh, Tupac, I find incredible. I mean, hip hop, I have a good conflicted relationship with hip hop because hip hop is so deeply embedded in misogyny and homophobia that it's it's tough to like, especially as an adult, right? Where you're looking at it now. But I appreciate the artistry and I appreciate the the themes of like self-determination and empowerment and sort of have to cringe at some of the cringier stuff they do. Can you do you want to say anything more about that? How how we navigate some of the more more problematic elements of culture that come through? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I can talk, I can speak to something really topical. I'm sure most of you have been following the the controversy surrounding Dave Chappelle's latest comedy special, right? And that was, this is a tough one because I've been a lifelong fan of Chappelle, from the Chappelle show. And as a black man, he often says things that no one else in the mainstream is saying on behalf of black people. But there is, it's undoubtable that he said some really shitty, thoughtless things about members of the LGBT community, and in particular, the, the trans community. And I think, to me, what was most insidious about his last special was the false dichotomy that he laid down. And, and, and by the way, I don't think he has ill intent. I don't think he, he, in his heart, consciously thinks he hates trans people, right? I don't know the guy, but I think he thought he was making, he was extending an olive branch and, and, and trying to make a, a profound statement. But when so many of my trans friends and my friends in the LGBT community have been saying publicly for a long time how offensive what he's saying is, how hurtful it is, and you, he, and you, you know, for a guy of that status to clearly know about it to the point where he's addressing it in a special and you continue to, to do this despite the fact that people are going, hey man, this isn't it, you're, you're hurting us. I just think it's, it's just really shitty. I think it's like, but, I, but, but at the same time, I can hold two things in my mind simultaneously. I think comedically, Chappelle has done some things that are ingenious. And I think things that he, he says on behalf of the black community are valid and I think they're beautiful. I think things he said about the trans community are trash. And both of those ideas can exist simultaneously. But the problem I find, we're in a culture now where it's all about uh, drawing sides and, and polarity. There's, there's no more nuanced conversation. You can't, you can't dissect something from an analytical standpoint or a critical standpoint and say, this works, this doesn't work. Because as soon as you say anything positive or negative on, a, on the other side, you are aligned with one of those sides. Like I remember I shared an article by a black queer man called The Betrayal of Dave, Ch Dave Chappelle that was condemning Dave Chappelle's special. I shared this on my social media. And, and in, in the heading, I said, look, I understand what he was trying to do in the context of, of comedy. I don't think he should be canceled. I'm not personally offended because I get what he was trying to do, but I think this is a really insightful thing to hear from a member of this community. On my wall, I shared this. And I had people coming to my wall going, you, you're trash. How, why are you defending Dave Chappelle? <laughs> It's just like I'm, sh I'm sharing an article that's tearing the guy down, right? But this is this is this is a scary thing about art, right? Is that you always expose yourself, you always expose yourself whether you're creating art or you're you're championing art in one way or another to to criticism. And I think it all it just comes down to personal integrity and articulating your position clearly. Thank you, Omari. I, I think you speak to a, a lot of issues that we in our college community think about a lot. I know I've had complicated conversations about texts we teach in class or conversations we've had after class. Sure. Um, it's, it is a very complicated world. And I will say, I, I recently quit Facebook, but I recently, I recently, I really miss your <laughs> engagement on social media. You're a very That's authentic right. person in that space. Thanks, um, of course, well, thank you. Can I, yeah. can, I, can I share something quickly about social media? Please do. And I know this is college, I'm talking to a lot of young people, and this is what blows my mind about social media. I don't know if a lot of people understand this. Each of us have our own media network. Each of us through Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you have your own Huffington Post or whatever, whatever media network you wanna call it. And to me, I think you should see your social media as uh, a media uh, conglomerate that you are curating content for. Like so, social media gets a bad rap because people say it's trash and it's just, that, but it's like, well, if your social media is trash, then maybe you need to look at your network <laughs> because Facebook doesn't create content. <laughs> they, they platform people and you can choose whose curated content goes through your feed. So this is a message I just want to send to people is like, you don't treat social media like it's, you know, a dumpster fire and it will not be. Well, it's interesting because I mean, you, you really predicted where I wanted to go <laughs> with this next question because you are fairly active on social media and putting out some occasionally uh, difficult and complicated perspectives. I'm wondering, I find that exhausting. Is this an extension of your, your creative and um, provocative self in the world? Is this something you feel you need to do? Is this something that recharges you? Why do you oh, do it? It definitely doesn't recharge me. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I, I, I literally feel an obligation and I'll, I mean, some of you guys, I, I mean, it's been a while now, so you might not know, but 
I, I am a professional actor by trade, right? And I can tell you exactly when my, my social media uh, activism, for lack of a better term, started. I was on uh, a Spike TV series called Blue Mountain State that was about college football in America. And that show was, or is one of the most offensive shows humanly imaginable. So much misogyny, like homophobia, like the, it was attempting to be satirical, but it was, it was broad and it did not land very often. And I was having young dudes, I still to this day have young dudes send me horrific messages that are not aligned in any way with who I am as a person. And I, I you know, I started my, my social media just thinking that I was going to be a theater artist and I'll, you know, keep in touch with my friends and family. But when you work in TV, what happens is you do a show and thousands of people will just add you after the credits roll, right? And, and I didn't have, my, to this day, my page is still public because I never thought I was going to be working in TV. So I realize if I have this platform based on mainstream content that can be somewhat toxic, it is my obligation to use it for something other than, you know, posting selfies and cat videos. Though I do do some of that as well. You might, one must really. <laughs> yeah, I'm not human. I have questions coming in about uh, cancel culture and conversations related to where we've gone. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do one more and then I'd like to get back to talking about creativity and talking about your art. Um, mm -hmm. We've just had a question come in asking, speaking of nuance, what are your thoughts about the idea of cancel culture in general and the state of artistic discourse right now? Look, I, I think by definition, cancel culture is a negative thing. Right. But I will also say a lot of people frame being held to account with being canceled. I think canceling someone for something that is uh, egregious is, is foul. But I think like, I don't know, if you're the mayor of a town and you go online and you tweet death to N words or like you tweet like pro Nazi stuff and you lose your job, that's not cancel culture. That's accountability. And I think there's this weird thing where freedom of speech and freedom of choice has never meant absence of accountability. And I don't know where people got this confused, right? So yeah, cancel culture sucks. And there are, in, there are instances when people have gotten canceled where I think it's unfair. But most of the time when I see people getting canceled, it's because they're being held accountable for something horrible they've done. So those are my, my that's my take. Thank you. We have a question about the various genres you work in. Uh, do you have a preference for one or the other, for being that TV actor, for being a poet, a writer? Mm -hmm. So I think when, I'm, when I've left this realm, hopefully many, many years from now, hopefully I can live a, a healthy life for a long time, just throwing it out there if the universe is listening. I think the thing that will best represent me is my writing. I think that's the most important work that I do, but I do voices for cartoons and that's by far the most fun. Uh, and anybody or fans of cartoon, I've done the voice of Black Panther since 2012 for different Marvel projects. And I get to do the voice of Corvus on the Netflix show, The Dragon Prince. And like, it's li literally making funny voices for a living and playing make-believe. It's the most fun thing ever. You go into the studio with a music stand and you're just playing around, like who would not love that? So good, so good. Um, we have an attendee asking if you can talk about any of your upcoming projects, things that you're excited about, that you're working I on. I can. So uh, for those of you in Montreal, uh, I wrote years, 10 years ago about, I wrote a play called, a hip hop theater piece called The Lamentable Tragedy of Sal Capone. It's about police brutality. It was inspired by the shooting of Freddie Villanueva, Villanueva, a kid from Montreal North who was shot by police. Um, and it's about, they, they were in a hip hop group and it's about the aftermath of his friends who survived. I was commissioned, oh, I've written a sequel and it's gonna debut at the Siegel Center, uh, the Siegel Center in Montreal in, um, it's gonna be in February, I think February 24th. And then it goes to the National Arts Center in Ottawa, March 15th. So there's that. Uh, season, season three of The Dragon Prince will be coming out soon-ish. Uh, if, you, if you have kids or if you like Marvel stuff, uh, Marvel Superhero Adventures is on Disney XD. You can check that out. And I ju just yesterday, I, I play different voices on Corner Gas, the animated series, but our last episode aired last night. So unfortunately, that's no longer happening. But 
I've, I've been oh and my and my wife and I co-wrote a play called uh, Redbone Coonhound, which is my wife Amy Lee Lavoie is also an amazing playwright who went to the National Theater School in Montreal. We co-wrote a play, and there's going to be an audio version of Redbone Coonhound. It's a satirical comedy about interracial relationships, and that'll be available in a couple months as well. That's great. Thank you so much. We have time for a couple more if anyone wants to send them in. Um, you know, you mentioned before the school tours you've done here in Montreal uh, in February. Do you want to talk a little bit about that work? Yeah. Um, so for over a decade now, it used to be in person, but we've switched to Zoom because the world. Uh, I've had the great privilege of going to schools across Canada and doing Black History Month presentations that focus on Canadian Black history. Because when I was in school with math back in the day at BHS, I remember hearing it's Black History Month. Like teachers would talk about it, but nothing happened. Like there was no, like they didn't change the curriculum or there was no, like they just went, it's Black History Month. And I remember as one of the only Black people in the school being like, hey, that's super cool. If there's a month about my people, can we, can we like have a, a flyer or something? Like one presentation? So then uh, my twin sister, I have a twin sister, Akila Newton, who runs a non profit called Overture with the Arts that provides performing arts training for youth in Montreal. My twin sister and I were basically like, we should do something. And it started at a couple schools in Montreal, uh, Beaconsfield High School being one of the first ones, and has now grown. Last year, I did, I think, 105 presentations in five different provinces. Well, it was on Zoom, but we, we visited five different provinces. So it's become an annual thing every February, and it's a chance for me to combine. And it, yeah, it combines elements of poetry, theater, spoken word, comedy, and just sharing stories about Canadian Black history through a comedic lens. It's really, that's so amazing. We've had a few um, people I mentioned that they recognize you. So I thought we should mention, yes, you've seen him. <laughs> if, you, if you went to high school in Montreal, there's a chance I came to your school. I came to your school and I did some poems and it's really, it's really, I mean, I feel old by the way, because what's crazy is now it's like kids who I were in grade seven, the first time I met them are probably in this class now. <laughs> Just insane. Time is terrifying. Um, oh, we've got a whole bunch of questions have come in in the past moment. Um, a specific question about the line uh, from your first poem, uh, might have been your second poem, I'm sorry, where you talk about your fist being black and your palm being white and wanting mm. to know how you came up with that image. Well, quite, quite literally, I, the line was, my palms are white, but when I fight, brown is the color of my fist. And one, they quite literally are, which it's funny. I remember some of my white friends didn't know this. And when they were like, what, dude, what the hell? This is what you look like as a white guy. <laughs> but I just, see, this is the wild thing about poetry, right? Is that it's not, an, it's not academic. I have no idea where that line came from. I made the observation that that's what it was. And it, it made for a powerful, I mean, one, as you guys notice, and this is where the theater and the writing comes in. This is generally a symbol of like, I come in peace and like, you know, you put your hands up, don't shoot. This is known as the black power uh, salute. So if you combine the physicality with the word, my palms are white, but when I fight, it makes for a really uh, evocative image when you're doing a poem. So that's, that's how that came to be. Got another very challenging question here about whether art leads revolution and change in society or rather reflects the societal change that we're seeing. What's your take on that? Are there any examples of art that you feel have been pivotal to change that you've experienced or do you think of it more as a, a reflective form? I think I think it, it can be both. You know, I think it's not a coincidence. And again, I'm not a historian, but there are a number of examples of uh, fascist regimes taking power in different countries and imprisoning artists, imprisoning poets, imprisoning museums, banning arts, banning music, banning, that's not a coincidence because they know, I mean, you even think back to like slave plantations, right? A lot of people don't, don't know this, but on slave plantations, music and singing was banned except for religious songs. So some of you might not know this, but the Negro spiritual songs like, you know, Wade in the Water or Follow the Drinking Gourd, these were, were meant as ways for white Christians to indoctrinate uh, enslaved African people with this new religion of Christianity. But they remixed those songs 
And they changed the context from being about religion to about escaping on the Underground Railroad, right? And they would use drums to send messages to people, uh, you know, to, to other Black people and other slaves to make their escape, right? So quite literally, music played a role in the liberation of Black people from servitude. So it's, it's objectively powerful, right? But yes, of course, there's times when music, I think, reflects society. You know, NWA famously talked about gangster rap, right? They, they ushered in gangster rap. They would always say, well, we just talk about a reality that we live. They didn't create the issue of, of dealing drugs and gangbanging, but they, that, that's what they knew. And they, they wrote about it and that's what it reflected. So it can be both. Thank you. We've had, uh, I think this should be our final question, a number of people asking just for advice to get started as a writer, as a creator. Do you have any advice for people getting into writing, finding their voice? Totally, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shamelessly steal from the great uh, Ira Glass, the radio personality from NPR. He has a brilliant, first of all, This American Life is one, is an international treasure. It's an amazing uh, radio documentary show. But Ira Glass has this video that I quote all the time where he says, what makes you an artist is your taste, right? So like, if you wanna be a guitar player, for example, you might uh, watch, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a legendary guitar player who's not uh, problematic, Eddie Van Halen. <laughs> the first name that came to my head was Eric Clapton. I was like, F that guy, I'm not saying his name. <laughs> Let's say <laughs> you, want, you want to be Jimmy Page or you wanna be Eddie Van Halen, right? So and I know I'm old, I'm, I'm quoting old school guys, Lenny Kravitz, whoever you were, Jack, Jack White, these newer peeps. So you see Jack White shredding on a guitar and you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. I wanna do that. And the first time you pick up a, a guitar, you would inevitably suck. Obviously, everybody starts off there not knowing what you're doing. And what Ira Glass says that's so brilliant is artists, young artists forget that when you start off, there's gonna be a massive chasm between your taste and your ability right? Because you know you're not that great because you've seen Jack White. But most people give up at that phase. They go, ah, I suck. I'm never going to be as good as Jack White. And they stop. So my advice to you is, remember, what makes you an artist is your taste. And if you keep working at it, you're going to get closer and closer and closer. Your, your skill and your taste will align. And one day you'll be like, you know what? I think Jack White would be really proud of this, or I think Spike Lee would really be really proud of my movie. The, the only secret, and it's not even a secret, and this is going to sound like the corniest Tony Robbins advice in the world, the only secret is don't give up. That's the only secret. Even if you don't end up being as good as Jack White, if you practice for five years every day playing the guitar, in five years you will be exponentially better than when you started, even if you never get to Jack White. So that's the key. Do it because you love it. I mean, first of all, pick something you love, right? If it feels like work, you probably pick the wrong thing. But find something you love and continue to do it obsessively and you will get better. And maybe one day somebody will pay you for it or come see you do it. Because Lord knows, and Jason and Matt both know this, because they're, you know, both of them were professional artists as well. The money doesn't start when you start. <laughs> You're not going to get rich early. So true. <laughs> Thank you, Omari. I, I, we really appreciate you coming here talking to us about this, uh, this passion. Uh, it really shows your passion for your work. And, and thank you for sharing it with us. Oh, dude, I, thank you for having me. I honestly feel like the luckiest human being in the world. I feel like I've like scammed life. I've never, <laughs> like, the first day job I ever had is right now at the Vancouver Film School. And my day job consists of choosing scenes for kid, for young actors to work on, watching movies and talking about why. I, like, I literally have a class where I choose my favorite movies and explain to people why the movies are awesome. People pay me to do this. And when I'm not doing that, I'm writing plays, I'm doing voices for cartoons, I get to work in, it's, I, I love what I do and I'm, I'm, I feel blessed every single day that I get to do this for a living. The first thing that Google tells me when I search for you, you know, is that you are Black Panther. So that is, that's pretty good. <laughs> that was a childhood dream, man. It was my favorite superhero as a kid. And when I found out I booked the role, I cried. Oh, Straight up. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, this concludes today's programming for the 2021 Symposium. Uh, we are back tomorrow and Friday. Just to give you a quick recap of some of the events we've got coming up tomorrow. Uh, from 10 to 12, we have a workshop on fake news, uh, talking about how to recognize fake news stories in your feed and everyday life. Uh, from 12 to 2, we have a roundtable discussion of representation and appropriation in art, literature, and media. 
really nice follow through on this talk we've had today. And then uh, at 2.40, we have a performance, a live performance streamed to us from Geordie Theater of Selfie. Um, do check out the program notes on that. There is a content advisory about that play. And then from four to six, we've had a lot of talks about it in this session, in the previous session. We have a talk on cancel culture tomorrow, uh, an opinion piece and discussion with uh, author Kai Cheng Tom. Um, yeah, I hope you'll be here with us. Uh, I will be here. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Vanier. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jason. Good to see all of you. Send my love to your family.